Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Miguel for the very kind invitation to be here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in, in Alto in person and to see how this workshop is, is, is really a big um, success and, and a lot of fun. Um, so I'm very pleased to open this day's um, series of talks, which is about using gaps to actually solve interesting science problems. And so I want to take a couple of minutes just to get everyone back up to speed, but then I want to talk about directions that I think are currently quite exciting and things that these models are making possible for my own field of, of inorganic chemistry. So when I give these introductory tools, I usually start by drawing a wiggly line and say, you know, we, we want to solve this problem, we want to know the energy of atomic structure as a function of where the atoms are. And as you all know, you can very accurately calculate the energy of atomic configurations at a couple of selected points. So this is probably going to be carbon in my cartoon here. So diamond is going to be a local energy minimum somewhere here. You can describe slightly more complicated structures, little carbon nanotube. Um, and these kinds of systems can be very accurately described with quantum mechanical methods. So at these selected points, the problem is basically solved. Of course, if you talk to Miguel, for example, about carbon materials, he will tell you, well, this is not what carbon materials look like. Um, they're much more complicated, and we have no chance of describing this entire function, of describing very, very complicated structures with quantum mechanical methods alone. So here come machine-learned interatomic potentials, and or GAP in particular. Um, and the way I often introduce these is, again, with, with wiggly lines and by saying there's three main ingredients you need to build an interatomic potential with machine learning. And as, as machine learning methods are based on learning from large data, that the first ingredient really is a good set of data. And that's absolutely crucial to select the right types of data points that you put into your fit. Um, and indeed, our group in Oxford is mainly focused on that side of the problem, developing approaches for building efficient databases from which we can learn. Once you've got your data, you need a mathematical representation of the atomic structure. Of course, we've heard about uh, SOAP by Albert and Gabor, and um, then you need, as the third part, the, the regression itself. So that's the task to, to actually learn from those data and to build your machine learned model. So very briefly, we've heard about iterative training before, and what that means is basically that you say, I, I know a couple of small-scale structures. I can do quantum mechanical simulations, such as this one here. Now, again, carbon. Um, this is a simulation done with ab initio MD. So I'm taking a couple of carbon atoms, heating them at very high temperature, and then cooling them very quickly. You see the color coding here gives you the coordination number. So you see the structure changes quite strongly when you take the liquid and cool it down. And that already tells you there's a lot of complicated structures um, happening. Early on, you do these simulations with quantum mechanics, and then once you have a, a first version of your potential, a somewhat decent model, you can use that to generate many, many, many structures, and you feed them back into your database. This is early work. I started working in this field in 2015, um, but the main ideas are still rather similar, in that you say, you start your building your model, and what I'm showing you here is a slightly more advanced picture, but it's the same idea. Um, that's the work done by uh, Linus Erhardt, who was a visiting student with us um, coming from the University of Darmstadt in Germany. Um, and he's, he's built a potential for silicon dioxide, SiO2. So he started with putting crystal structures and some empirical snapshots from uh, empirical potential MD into a first version of a database, fitting a model to that. And you see this kind of um, workflow here on the, on the screen. Um, so you fit your first version of potential. It's not going to be very good. So you're not happy with it. You go and run molecular dynamics with that, and you take more and more snapshots from those simulations, feed them back into your database until at some point you're converged. And you see how early on your structures look a bit strange and disordered, and later on you start generating lots of fourfold and twofold connected networks. So that idea is, I think, pretty much established nowadays. Um, when I'm, I don't want to talk a lot about descriptors, but I need to mention them. And the way I often introduce those, again, is by using this carbon toy example. So we're taking two carbon atoms 
in a big box, right? And, and we're calculating the energy of those carbon atoms as a function of distance. That's quantum mechanics, right? Those blue points are what we want to learn. And now we went and fitted with one of the best structural descriptors out there and fitted a first version of a gap, and that looks like this. So I think this plot kind of shows you what machine learning models are about. They're very good in the region where they've seen data, but they can be very, very bad in regions where they haven't seen any, and everyone will agree this is not a very good potential. How do you fix that problem? Well, you think carefully about how you actually need to represent your structure. In this case, the SOAP is very high dimensional, it's very flexible, but you could try and use a more simple model. You can look at only distances between atoms. That's not going to give you a very good carbon potential, but it does capture the repulsion between atoms. And if you then go and combine these models, we've seen some two-body plus SOAP and models like those, that's where we've um, shown that in 2017. So that can be, that can be done quite successfully. Um, the regression, that's the last of the three ingredients that you need. And of course, there's, there's many successful methods out there. Um, the three main areas, uh, the three main categories, artificial neural networks are introduced by Jörg Behler and, and others, um, kernel methods based on similarity measures between atoms, and then linear fitted models, MTPs, SNAPs. We've seen a little bit of MTPs yesterday. Um, all I'm going to talk about today is done, of course, with GAP, which is a kernel method. Um, so the idea of comparing atomic environments, that's this kernel function K, that's quite um, intuitive. It gives you a measure between zero and one, how similar two environments are. And what I need now is this coefficient here. See, so how do I get those? Um, I've been thinking about that a lot as a chemist, and I'm not familiar with all the mathematical backgrounds. So I said, well, let, let's all go together. And we've uh, recently written a rather detailed overview paper. I'm going to just put this up here. It's open access, so you can, um, you can download it and read it. And we've written all that background in, and we try to explain and show what the method looks like. So just to show you briefly what GPR fitting means, you have your um, equation here. Well, you have a set of data. You have data locations, that's your X, that's your structures, and you have labels, Y, that's your DFT data. You take those data, that's your vector Y, and then you have the kernel matrix here that's built from the atomic coordinates. You have this regularization, that's the sigma, so that's the expected noise in your data. And you put that together, you get a set of coefficients, um, you solve for that blue thing, and you can use it to predict the energy, for example, of a new configuration that you haven't seen. And of course, if you try and do that, that, that vector C is as long as your list of data. So if you have hundreds of thousands of input points, that's not a very good thing to do. So of course, you don't do that in practice. Um, you use something called sparse GPR. That's described in Albert's paper 2010. And we've then also tried to illustrate how that works. It's a bit more complicated, but at the end, you end up with a much shorter coefficient vector. And that allows you to do predictions that are independent of how large your database is, right? So we can learn from very big data sets and still make efficient predictions. More on that is in our overview paper. I don't want to go into detail. I want to say, okay, we're now here. The method is very far advanced. It's been successfully used a lot of times. And what are now directions for using it in the future? And where, where could the field be going from the perspective of a chemist? And the first thing, this came up yesterday in the discussion, um, whether we should keep building general purpose potentials and, and whether it makes sense to have a potential that can do lots and lots of different things, including problems for which it hasn't been trained. I want to show you one of those problems that I think is quite exciting. So um, in our group, we, we like amorphous materials, and we've been looking at disordered uh, stuff a lot. Um, and you've seen the silicon potential by Albert and colleagues in 2018. Um, which is actually quite good for amorphous silicon. So back in 2018, we tested this for, for amorphous phases, and we, we did all the validation. You test against various experimental properties. And we could show, well, this is the typical system size you can treat with up in Nisho MD. This was the system size back at the time, 4,000 atoms. So it's, it's, it, it felt like a big lot. I remember sending someone a screenshot of that on my phone. I was very excited. I looked, 4,000 atoms, cool. Um, now, what we've done subsequently is then build bigger model of amorphous silicon, which is 100,000 atoms, um, which we published last year. Um, so we've basically gone and taken liquid silicon. It's the same kind of simulation I've shown you at the start. So we take liquid silicon, cool it, it expands. When you freeze it, um, you change from a high-coordinate liquid in red to a four-fold coordinate amorphous structure. 
it becomes more similar to diamond type silicon. You've seen these soap similarity plots in Joe's talk yesterday. Um, you can look at the local stability and you can test again against all sorts of experimental properties. So this is the experimental structure factor and you need to get the first sharp diffraction peak right to prove that you've made good amorphous silicon. But you could say, well, this is all clear and we know what amorphous silicon looks like. So what's the novelty? Why do we need a general potential? So I'm going to show you a problem that hasn't been accessible so far. If you take amorphous silicon and compress it, it does very strange things and it ends up being a crystalline phase. It turns into simple hexagonal silicon. And people weren't really sure why that happens. So what we've done is we've said, let's take this structure and squeeze it in a molecular dynamic simulation. Color coding shows coordination numbers, so the purple atoms are fourfold connected. I'm taking this structure and slowly compressing it from zero to 20 gigapascals. You see at first, the atoms are wobbling around, but not a lot of uh, anything is happening. Keep watching the video, um, because all of a sudden, you see that the structure does change very drastically, and I'll keep watching it, because you're going from this very, very disordered phase. You see little ordered regions growing, and they get larger and larger, and that's a polycrystalline sample. And if you look closely, you see the 2D hexagonal close packing. That's silicon 5. That's what you see under pressure in X-ray diffraction. And that's what we've seen with this simulation for the first time. So we have a rather complex series of transitions, and that's something you can't capture with existing empirical force fields. That's where you need machine learning models, which are so flexible that they can predict previously unseen things. So you see a collapse in the unit cell volume, a strong change in coordination. You can now tease out all that information about your atomic um, coordinates from the simulation because you have full atomistic data right, on the length scale of 10 nanometers. We've gone to great lengths to, to make sure that our prediction is valid, so we've tested different types of gap models. Here's a different model fitted to scan data. Here's a, um, a, what people call them a delta learning model, so there's corrections beyond DFT, and they all show the same physical effect, collapse and then crystallization, which a classical potential shown here in dashed lines does not do. Um, again, you can go and characterize how similar it is to crystalline phase, and that shows you the simple hexagonal popping up under pressure. Um, and you can look, actually, you can look at local enthalpies. I don't want to say too much about local energies, because Zach is going to talk about that more. Um, but you can see how these um, crystalline regions in blue stabilize locally the phase. And that's, of course, a crystal is more stable than a disordered phase, so that, that does make sense. Um, you're going to say, well, amorphous silicon under a very high pressure is a very sort of specific example, maybe of academic interest, but I think that these kinds of pictures where you have a polycrystalline sample are actually very, very interesting for solid state chemists, because when we make samples in the lab, right, they're not perfectly crystalline, they're not infinitely extended, but they're polycrystalline, sometimes nanocrystalline, and we have only started to understand, I think, what happens at these grain boundaries between the different grains, and we can now describe these sorts of problems with GAP and other ML potential models. So this is um, silicon, um, and again, we're in the process of building potentials for more complicated systems, I'm sure many of us are, um, and the hope is that those will really be available for using them off the shelf. Not in all cases, there are some cases when um, on the fly learning, as, as Tamash has shown, is the exactly right thing to do. But there are those systems, silicon, silica, a couple others, where it is really worth having a general purpose potential that can do loads of things. The second direction I want to discuss here is, is um, how do we bring together the problem of exploring structures and of fitting them. And um, this goes back to some early experiments. I'm going to show you another cartoon. Um, so these are some experiments I've done a couple years back. So I said, what if, what if I take just random atomic positions, right, nonsense structures, and put them in unit cells and fit a potential? The potential is going to be very poor, um, but it will know a little bit about the material. So I use that potential to do crystal structure searching, as people have been doing with quantum mechanics. I search for possible crystal structures, and I generate new snapshots. I feed them back into my database, just like I've been doing with, uh, with iterative training. Um, and then gradually I grow my database and gradually I'm exploring low energy regions. Now this is a cartoon, let me show you some data that prove that this works. The very first time we found a structure from scratch um, was black phosphorus. So this is a 2018 paper from a Faraday discussions meeting actually. Um, so you see this, this is the error for two different types of phosphorus structures. And you see for black phosphorus after a couple of iterations the error drops very drastically. And that's because the method has discovered 
what puckered black phosphorus layers look like. Um, this has been extended a lot. This is work of Norm Bernstein. I don't want to say much because he's going to speak later today, but just to show you this is another very tricky benchmark for crystal structure prediction, boron, um, and you see gradually these boron icosahedra emerging during the structure searches. Once you've done that, you get, and now this is a, also a hat tip to what Bing Jing has shown us yesterday, structure maps. So I've pulled together graphite, uh, uh, carbon, silicon, and titanium structures all in one. You see open graphite structures, fourfold connected networks. Up here, there's silicon five somewhere, and then HCP and omega titanium. Um, you get all the known phases that you expect from textbooks, but also you get this very high energy structure up there. And that's a really critical part because that's what you need to make flexible potentials. Once you have that method and you can do crystal structure searching, of course you can use it to search for possibly new structures. Um, phosphorus is a very sort of structurally creative element. We've looked a little bit at that recently. So um, you can take, this is a structure of fibrous phosphorus. It consists of these cage-like fragments. Um, and we've started taking these fragments and putting them together in various ways, finding hypothetical but quite reasonable um, phosphorus structures. Uh, those here, some based on P8 cages, you see these sort of helix structures. Those are hypothetical structures at the moment, but they just illustrate how diverse uh, phosphorus is in terms of its structural chemistry. And it's a test case for using maybe more advanced crystal structure prediction methods that allow us to access structures with hundreds of atoms in the unit cell. Jumping back to potential making, and to have just said we're very interested in database building. The other consequence of this approach is that actually you're sampling so many diverse structures that you can use it to build very useful potential fitting databases. Now, in this, there's another structure map, and this is for phosphorus. There is light gray points scattered basically all over the place, and that's the RSS data set that came from the Faraday discussions they have just shown you. Um, so I said, what happens if I now put all sorts of known things into this database. And if you want to study phosphorus, you're looking at the liquid-liquid phase transition between two types of liquid. Um, you're looking at all the, here's a couple of these, here's, here's black phosphorus that we found before, right? But there's others. Um, in phosphorus, you're interested in layered structures, phosphory, nano ribbons that have been synthesized. And all that goes into your database. And in fact, I've redrawn this picture slightly because I, I like the idea of saying you could make this random search part of a recipe for, for building general purpose potential. So we've got random search sketched at the top right. And then of course we have the iterative MD that I've shown you at the start, that's in orange. Um, you will have crystallographic data that you can get from databases and you have some things that you build manually. In this case, your phosphorus nanoribbons. Take all these four things together, adapt them to your problem. And I, that's my suggestion at the moment for how to build a really useful fitting database. Um, just to show you how different parts of the database cater to different problems, those manually built cells, for example, allow you to predict very accurately the exfoliation curve of phosphorine. This is actually done using many body dispersion corrected um, DFT in collaboration with Miguel, who is here. Um, and uh, we could show that actually we are getting the exfoliation of that very, very accurately ref with reference to quantum mechanical data. At the same time, having Iterative MD in the training allows us to describe complex phenomena such as the liquid-liquid transition in phosphorus where you take a P4 liquid and compress it and it turns into something entirely different. If you look back at this picture and you say, well, you know, there's all sorts of aspects of, of phosphorus in there. There's one very important thing missing and I've just claimed that we're so interested in amorphous things. So, so why is no amorphous phosphorus on this map? That's because people just were not sure what exactly amorphous phosphorus looks like. It's one of the big problems in structural chemistry of the elements. Right? So there's a lot of ideas and a lot of indirect experimental observations, but it wasn't really clear what it looks like. So this is work done recently by a master's student, Will Kirkpatrick, and then um, by uh, Yuxing Zhou, who's a default student in the group. Um, so we've thought about many, many ways how you could generate possible amorphous structures, and the way that ultimately they found was take a dense liquid, expand it, and cool it extremely slowly. Right? So you're using that as a proxy for finding possible structures, and as you cool your metastable liquid, you see the coordination changing drastically again. This light blue line is threefold connected atoms. It's a group five element, right? So that makes sense. All atoms are, almost all atoms are threefold bonded, um, as you see in this structure picture here. Um, the structure is made up, quite interesting, of, of lots of different fragments, including those P8 cages I've just shown you. So you see all the 
typical fragments that people have studied for a long time emerging in your amorphous structure. There's very few tetrahedral motifs, for example, there's few threefold rings, but there's lots of five-membered rings that make up the structure. And that fits with all that we know about phosphorus, because Hittorfs and fibrous also are based on five-membered rings. Um, once we've got that, we can say, well, can we actually explain what's happening experimentally? This is a high-pressure experiment um, done on phosphorus a couple years back. And what I'm showing you here is actually Eugene's computed data. So these are simulated structure facts. And you see this. I've just said the first sharp peak is the, the important fingerprint of the structure. So you see that thing here, which disappears almost completely if you squeeze the structure and it comes back. So you can then analyze the location and the height of this peak and compare it to all sorts of experiments that people have done before. And by saying you get a good agreement with all that body of evidence, together with spectroscopy, together with calorimetry, you can prove that actually this is a pretty reasonable structure model of amorphous phosphorus. And this is what it looks like. So you see many five-membered rings, some three connected atoms. So we're quite happy about that. But again, we like. Uh, some of the people ask me, why do we talk about elements all the time? I say because they're quite, quite interesting. Um, Right, so going from very fundamental problems in the structural chemistry of elements to something a bit more applied, and that's something we've been looking at very recently, and that's actually a question, can we model a material at the full length scale of a device? I've just shown you this silicon structure 10 nanometers long, and that means you're reaching the actual size of device that people make in the lab. And that allows you to study problems that are actually quite interesting for practical applications. Um, so the compounds I want to talk about briefly here um, are calcogenides from the germanium antimony tellurium system. We've already seen a poster um, about those. You use them in digital memories. That goes back to rewritable DVDs. Now we use it in um, Intel X-Point devices and all sorts of other things, um, in photonics, in uh, flexible displays. So these are really, really interesting materials. And what makes them interesting? You take the crystalline structures. This is germanium telluride and you switch them with a laser pulse or with dual heating, and you turn them into something that looks very, very different. That's an amorphous phase. And because they have different properties, these two phases can encode ones and zeros. And then you talk to your engineers, and they know how to build a, a device out of that. Um, most of these materials are located on this, what we call the quasi binary line. And one way to draw these structures, actually, in this way, so that you see how they're all sort of made up of relatively similar structural building blocks. Um, and of course, this system has been one of the most important applications for ML potentials so far. So just to briefly um, uh, um, credit other people's work. So, so this actually goes back to 2012, when uh, Gabriele Soss, who's now in Warwick, made a uh, neural network type potential for germanium telluride. And they've done a lot of really, really interesting studies on that endpoint of the um, quasi-binary line. 2018, Felix Mukano, who's actually in the audience, uh, made a potential for this comma 225, that's the canonical um, phase change material that uh, people like to study. And I'm not going to say any more about the potential. I think we're going to hear about, about that more. Um, what we've now said, well, like, can we make a potential which does this entire line, and which has seen training data for all the phases on that line from germanium telluride to antimony to tellurium 3? Um, so we've done that. Well, Yujing has, has done that. Um, we've just uploaded an archive, so you can, you can read the details there. Um, but again, we've validated the potential. We've shown, yeah, we can pr reproduce um, structural properties. And again, because they are quite intricate, we have to make sure they're OK along the whole line. Um, here's one interesting feature of these uh, glassy phases. You have a, a piles-like distortion. It's not, it's not in a crystalline phase, but you do have a slight asymmetry um, between short and long bonds. And you can use structural fingerprints from up in in blue, compare that to GAPMD, and make sure that they match along the whole line from the two um, binary phases to one another. Once you've got that, you can simulate processes such as the switching from zero to one. That's a, just to give you a reference. This is um, a simulation with 1,008 atoms that was run for over six months on a big high-performance computing system. We've published that earlier this year. Um, that was ab initio MD. And now Yijing Wen did the same thing in a couple of days with the gap. So uh, I'm not going to comment on it. Ab initio MD and its, its future, but that was quite impressive. Once you've got that, you can simulate problems such as um, multi-level switching. So, so you have um, iterative process where you say you, you don't just apply one pulse, but you apply multiple of them. Um, and we've tested that that actually can be simulated. 
Of course, that was 1,008 atoms, but you can go to much, much bigger systems. So just to show you a preview of what that is, memory devices um, often look like this, that you have a mushroom-type geometry. So you've got a heat at the bottom that heats the, um, the crystalline bit and melts it. And you can describe that process. Now, this is 14 nanometers across, um, and you can actually work out the temperature profile from your simulation. That's something on the right that you can compare um, to, to what's happening in the real device. And just another preview here. So this is the um, device geometry for, for the X-point memories that has been um, published before. Um, and what we're showing here is a reset simulation. We're taking the crystalline phase and we're heating it very quickly. Um, and that system is 20 by 20 by 40 nanometers. So that's the actual size of the device in your memory that you can buy. Um, so that's quite um, exciting, I think, and takes us a step closer to really understanding what's going on inside these functional materials. And I want to say too much, there's um, more info on that in the preprint. And I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about a slightly different point. So um, I've talked about using gaps and how they're really amazing. They've really transformed what we're um, doing in the field, I think. But also, they're not you know, standing there on their own, but they're part of the whole materials modeling ecosystem that we've had for many years. And the last point I want to make here is that there's actually a lot of synergy to be had between gap modeling and all those very useful DFT methods, and in particular, analysis of the electronic structure. Another type of carbon here, this is porous carbon, so you take organic carbon materials and paralyze them, and you get all sorts of strange disordered structures. They look locally like graphite, but longer range, they're quite disordered, have pores of different size, and people in electrochemical energy storage are very interested in these because you can put ions in there and build supercapacitors of batteries. Um, so here's some work done by um, Xianqing Huang, in, who was a visiting student in Cambridge at the time uh, and did a very nice work here on, on trying to understand what happens if you insert lithium or sodium or potassium in these different types of porous carbon materials. Um, so you can basically make accurate structure models with very fast gap-driven simulations, but your gap only knows carbon. So you take these structures and then analyze them using DFT. You insert any metal or other species you like. Um, and we've, we've looked at lithium insertion um, Céline Mellet in Toulouse has done um, iron insertion for, for supercapacitors, also based on these gap structures. So it's all very sort of uh, nicely coming together. You can go, once you've got your structures and energetics, you can use the energy to predict the voltage, and you know how many lithiums you've put in, so you know the capacity, the um, horizontal axis, and with that you can predict the voltage curve, which is the experimental fingerprint of your battery material. Again, because you have atomistic information and quantum mechanics available, you can study, for example, the charges on the ions in the system, and that quite nicely matched what um, was done in a collaborator's group earlier, where they've studied the change in the NMR signal as you charge and discharge your battery. So you see it at low lithium concentration. Um, this was done together with the Gray Group in Cambridge. Um, so you see um, what the previous study was, I think. Uh, so, so you've got the um, lithium plus ions at small filling, but then as you put more and more lithium in, you end up having a more metal-like. It doesn't go to full lithium zero, but it does go to much more metal-like areas. And again, a structure map here that shows you how the local lithium environments change as you charge your battery. So um, taking one step back and saying, how, is, how does gap modeling actually benefit from DFT and vice versa? So um, a lot of what we're seeing at this workshop is using DFT data to learn accurate potential models. And you see this arrow here in blue. Of course, that's, that's the main motivation for us to build force fields. I'm going to claim that you can actually do it the other way around. You can build libraries of small-scale structures. They're just 200 atoms, but they're small enough to do DFT. And that opens up a much, much larger field of applications because many people are not expert gap users, but they are expert DFT users. So there's a huge potential there, I think. Um, no pun intended, sorry. Um, so the other side of this diagram is going from machine learning potentials to experiments, because we're able to describe on a large scale, I've shown you a few simulations on tens of nanometers of length scale. Um, so we can realistically describe how structure and reactivity change in real materials, and that allows us to link together with experiments and vice versa. I'm, I'd, I'd be very interested in seeing, can our experimental friends um, make specific experiments 
create good benchmarks for us for validation. I could go and talk about validation for half an hour, I'm not going to do that. But I think there's a huge chance as well in making sure that our potentials are actually as accurate as we can have them. And then finally, um, if you're bringing together these two sides of that triangle, um, you, um, you can say, well, you could actually go and predict spectra. In fact, Miguel's group has done um, really, really cool work on predicting XPS fingerprints. You've seen a bit of that um, here at the workshop. So you can use those structures and predict from quantum mechanics what different spectral fingerprints look like or other experimental observables. So it seems there's a lot of possible synergy going on. Right, with that I'd like to close my talk, say a big thank you to collaborators on this work and also to the group in Oxford. Um, recent picture here. Um, I've not said anything about Joe's work and Zach's work, they're presenting themselves. I've shown you some of Eugene's work, who is here just on the left. Um, and um, the last thing I want to say before I'm closing the talk is just to say we are currently um, recruiting. So the group is growing. Um, we've recently uh, been awarded a large grant, and that means that we've just yesterday made live two adverts for postdoctoral positions. So if you're looking for, for a new challenge, maybe if you're interested, um, do have a look. We have two posts open, one for um, computational materials chemistry focused on potential development, one on machine learning for chemistry. Um, both jobs are live on the chemistry department's website, or you, know, you can have an informal chat, but they, the official adverts are there. Um, and with that, I'd like to yeah, just put up my summary. I'm not going to read it out. I've told you about these various things. Um, and just want to say thank you very much again. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I look forward to continuing the discussions together. Thank you very much. <laughs>